34, uh, and also another piece of, uh, no, Proverbs. Be not afraid, be not afraid of sudden fear, nor of the desolation of the wicked. Be not afraid, be not afraid of sudden fear, or of the desolation of the wicked. Wow. For the Lord will be our confidence and will keep your This is Psalm 34. I'll bless the Lord at all times. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you're going to sing on this one, right? Yeah. Yeah. The, it says, The Lord inhabits our praises. Yeah. That's the power in that. Also, that His word performs its purpose. So, when we're singing and praising Him and speaking His word, that's powerful. Yeah. Yeah. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul will make her boast in thee, Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord.
excited to be in God's house, and we want you guys to, um, as much as possible, feel the presence of the Lord here today. And in the next few weeks, as we are going through this journey together as a church, and the holidays will be upon us, upon us before we even know it, I want you guys to be thinking about our Thanksgiving communion. The next month, we'll be doing it the week, the Sunday before Thanksgiving. But I would like to also say that as we thanks the Sunday after Thanksgiving, those of us who are here, with that we would uh, call it Leftover Sunday. <laughs> and that we would have uh, some groceries brought up and have a great <laughs> time of fellowship. Uh, it doesn't have to be turkey, but it just would be leftovers. And so I want you guys to be thinking about that. And communion is important. This time of year is a time of Thanksgiving. It's a time of harvest. And so we should be thankful for what God is bringing to us in all the blessings that he has. And remember, communion and baptism are the only two ceremonies given to us in the church. The only two ordinances. So... That's important. Baptism is a picture of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ and is done after your salvation. Very clearly taught, it brings into the membership of the church. When you're saved, you're baptized, and you become a member of the fellowship. Communion carries that fellowship over. Communion brings us to the fellowship of the saints. And the Lord is very clear that we're to do this. What's it say behind that table behind me? What's it say? In remembrance, In remembrance of who? Jesus Christ. That's right. In remembrance of me. And the Bible's very clear as often as you do it. But we typically do it at this time during the Thanksgiving season. So we want you guys to remember that. Marty, if you wouldn't mind coming up and taking the offering and then... Uh, Deb's going to sing us a couple more songs. Along with us singing all glory, about honor and power to his name also. Uh, probably everybody's already hit the plate, but I've asked the officer just to stand, and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll still pass it through. But he's going to bless the offering and uh, open us in prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning, Father, and thank you so much for uh, allowing us to be here. Lord, I'll be with the pastor to bring some message. Thank you for what Marty brought to the table this week. This morning, Lord, we're thankful that everybody's here. Uh, Father, we just, uh, what do we begin to thank you? And like the song said, it's a constant uh, praise and worship to your name. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 amen.
Hallelujah, right? Hallelujah. Lift our highest praise to Him is what that means. To bring it to exaltation, to bring it to that He is worthy. And I want you guys to, if you can remember what we talked about, I, I use the word ceremony and not ritual. Because when we come together, communion is not a ritual. It's a, really not even a ceremony. It's surely not a sacrament. Communion is an order. We're to come and commune together as we commune with the Lord. And obviously, thanksgiving for what Christ has done for us. And that's why we should sing hallelujah. That's why we should come to a time where the Lord's table is to be celebrated. And I want you to know that it's important to me to bring this to your attention in this fall season. Because of the seriousness of it but also because of how it is important for the church. And the Bible says, as often as you do it, do it in remembrance of me. It doesn't say in some groups do it every week, some groups do it every quarter, but we take these times, and obviously during the resurrection season, we will come back to the table. And we have felt at special times of needs and prayer, we would do it at that time. But these are really what the church calls. And I want you guys just to see this. This is the ordinances. It's important for you to note this. This is the baptism, which is put into the Great Commission, which implies the initial following of Christ. When you get saved and you are, what's done in your heart is shown evidence by the picture of the death and burial and resurrection. But then following that is the communion with Christ that we have because he is now in us. And then we have that together. So... What I get from our list here of prayer is so important that we take this time to go through this each and every week. The church is to meet and gather for prayer, which is part of our communion with God. And then it's to meet in fellowship, recognizing the death and burial and resurrection. Uh, it's, it's the Lord's Supper and it's baptism. It's that simple. And you know that, and I'm, I'm not saying this because thinking we're higher or better than anybody else, but it's misrepresented around the world. It is to be done within that local group and universally taught that we can connect with others in this, but with the pastors and the deacons and the leadership of the church administrate this. And so that's why we come together. The Corinthians had it all wrong. Paul has to straighten them out. The Corinthians were fleshly. And in chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians, he says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. I think that's something you can do privately, by the way. But when the church comes together, and that is the context of chapter 11, Corporately, you need to do it right because verse 27 puts it this way. Whoever therefore eats and drinks, eats the bread, drinks the cup in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. It wasn't that they had just had an unconfessed sin. They were having debauchery at the church. They were bringing so much food. They were pigging out and then getting drunk at the same time. I can't imagine that happening, but it does. People get caught up in the flesh and they degrade the Lord. When you come because you're saved and you know you're born again, you're worthy, okay? You may have had a bad thought in the process before you take communion. That's not what this is talking about. This is talking about those who know him take the table. And, and it's ended with this, let a person examine himself. Some of those guys, had, God took them out. Because they were doing it. And I believe that happens around the world still to this day with false churches, false religion. 
And, and so you examine yourself, it says in verse 28, and eat the bread and drink the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment upon himself. God's it's very serious about this. I want each and every one of us, as we come to this time, to remember, yes, we're going to be thankful for the harvest. We're going to relate to that here in the message here in the next few minutes. But we're going to also know that it is representative of what Christ done for us through his body and his blood. And that is not a sacrament. That is just a symbol of what Christ has done for us. And a beautiful, beautiful picture of communion. Now, with that in mind, got to talk about some grapes this morning. Okay, I, I love seedless grapes, okay? The best grapes in the world I have found come from Korea. And when you get the Korean grapes, they have great seeds, but those things look like huge plums, but they're grapes. And I mean, they've got some meat and the flavor explodes. But grapes are important, right? They're part of our diet. And believe me, they're good for your diet, right? Okay? However, in the church, there was always a problem. Because grapes only last literally about 10 days before they start to ferment. They get sour. They turn to wine. In the Bible with communion, you never find this. But when communion is taken, the Lord's table is taken in all the Gospels and in Corinthians, it's always called the fruit of the vine. But for centuries, the churches in the Middle East... Europe, and then eventually East, and the, and, and the New World, the West, would serve wine at, at the Lord's table. I don't think God's upset about it, but imagine this. You're in that Corinthian church, and you've got a predisposition to alcohol. You're an alcoholic, and have gotten saved from drunkenness. You come to church, and you ended up getting drunk. So it was a problem, okay? And grapes turned to wine Fast, not like barley and beer or rye and whiskey, right? There was a man who came along. His name was Tom Welch, and he decided he was Methodist. He was a preacher. His parents were from England. He came over. He was preaching in New York. He thought that this was not right to see some of the people that he saw in his Methodist church fall off the wagon. Because here they were offering fermented grape juice. So he decided that he was going to get serious. And I got to admit, this is what's interesting to me. He still stayed as a pastor and as a minister, but he lost his voice and wasn't able to preach. At that time, no amplification. So he Got, went into the medical field and was motivated to get a grape juice that would not ferment. And he found it. He took Louis Pasteur's formula, began reworking it, reworking it, reworking it. To be fair, the rabbi teachings in the first century when Jesus walked the earth said that when you take the Passover, which is the Old Testament, where the the communion comes from, the Lord's table comes from, they actually wrote to dilute the water, uh, the wine into water, three parts to one. There's actually some writings where it says 20 parts to one. But he didn't want to do that. He wanted to get the grape juice. You can't have grape juice if it's a 10-day fermentation only during the harvest time, which was around this time of year, late September, October. Then after that, you want to have communion at Easter time, Look out. Could be a little iffy, right? So that's why he decided to do this. So he took that, and it's interesting, he called it Dr. Welch's unfermented wine. And he got the mission. He started traveling around the United States. This was in the 1850s. And by 1865, he's bottling this, and he's got the Methodist Church and the Episcopal Church, and eventually all the churches going to this. So that they could begin what would become the temperance movement. The Bible doesn't say drinking is a sin. The Bible says drunkenness is a sin. But you and I both know it can be a trigger for many people. 
depending upon your makeup, right? And so this was something that was very, very powerful to him. And so he did not want to see this problem. Here we, they were winning people. Methodists were going through great revivals at this time. A, a second great awakening was happening after the Civil War. By the way, he was very involved in the Underground Railroad and, and, and was with um, Harriet Tubman. So he had a great ministry of serving people, and he believed very strongly in seeing the, the slaves get, get set free, even though New York and the stock exchange was making so much money off of slavery at the time. It was horrible. So he was definitely practicing out his faith, but this was his passion. So he started, he was no longer actually the pastor of the church, but he was leaders of the church, in leadership of the church. He started this great drink, and the advertisements of this great drink was so much fun. You go look through the history of it, and they were just celebrating the fact that they could have unfermented wine without getting drunk. Thank you, Dr. Welch. Amen? Amen. Isn't that a blessing? Amen. And so it brings us back to the fruit of the vine, and while that's important, and plays into our message today. Take your Bibles and turn to Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14 We've entitled the message, What Kind of Grape Are You? <laughs> or, what kind of grape are you? Are you a sour grape? That's sour grapes. Are you a plum, juicy grape that's unfermented? Or are you a grape that's dried up, dead like an old raisin? <laughs> Only you don't have any sugar on you. I'm just saying, you know? So we have to understand that there was a reason for that little history lesson. I wanted you, the brethren and sistren of the church, sistren of the church, the brethren and sisters of the church. I have to admit, I did that on purpose too. But anyway, I had fun thinking about that. And, um, it's just just a blessing to see how God works through his people. Amen. Amen. And, and, and we can enjoy the benefits of it. The Bible calls the drink at communion the fruit of the vine. And we are to call to be connected to the vine in Christ. John chapter 15 brings us out. And I'm asking, are you connected to the vine? Are you a grape? That's how we're starting this passage and this message out this morning. Is that if you're not connected to the vine, the Bible is very clear. You're a grape. But what kind of grape are you? And that's what we're going to discover this morning. I entitled this that because of verses 6, technically all the way to verse 16. When we get into verse 17 and 18, 19 and 20, it changes just a little bit and brings us to Revelation 18 and 19. And so my outline this morning is there's the primo grapes. And that was really last week. 144,000 are known in verse number 4 and 5 as the first fruits. They are the witnesses of it. But then we see the poison grapes, and they are here today. But you have the peaceful grapes that we believe are part of the church, and in the time of the Great Tribulation, they'll be also part of God's family, that we will greatly rejoice with them. And then you have the packaged grapes, and I had a little fun putting that together, packaging as they're going to be herded up, so to speak. And then you have, lastly, the pressed grapes. And so that's our message today. Which grape are you? The primo grapes, just as a, a way of, of mentioning this, it, it's so important to understand that we, they're not perfect, but they're unblemished. They're unblemished in the sense that their character goes with them, as it says in verse 4, as they follow the Lamb. Guys, that's where we need to see this. Those who follow the Lamb. When you're actively following the Lamb, we believe these are literal Jewish men. They are part of the 12 tribes. We believe that they are following the Lamb. They have been going through all the Great Tribulation as we're headed towards the end of it now. And then it says that they are the first fruits. And that is the dedicated group that comes in. By the way, Christ is the first fruit of, of literally the Trinity of God himself. And 
Also, there are passages in Paul's writings that says that when he came into areas that were virgin territories that did not know the gospel, that they were the first fruits of that group. When this church was started, there are a couple, two or three of you that are here now. You're the first fruits of that church. You're the character of that church. The old expression would be the pillars of the church. We don't understand what that means as far as the church being a building, but I like the fact that it's a way more biblical term of first fruits. When God moves in your life to do a mission, and that mission is embarked upon, I could use it as no simpler a mission of what's happened here in music in these last few months. That's a first fruit of music. Amen. And it's pure, and it's, it's powerful. Very simple, as the Israel was to give the offerings of the first fruits be, to show what was important. So they're the primo grapes, okay? They're the ones that are leading the way, and especially in this time of great tribulation. Now, guys, I'm going to say this at this point because they're having this massive revival, but when you hear the word tribulation, you and I think of trials, we think of troubles. Got problems? Yeah. That's not what this word means. This word means to be pressed upon, and it means to be squeezed upon. That's very close to what we're talking about here in the chapter that we're finding in Revelation. It's connected. And God is going to take his good grapes, not just the primo grapes, and I'm here to tell you he's going to squeeze you. Just like we ended last week talking about catfish chasing after codfish. Y'all remember that? I can't get more practical than this. Y'all understand? Those codfish got stronger because them catfish were going to eat them. All right? God's making you stronger through the pressing down the tribulations that are going in your life. Sometimes it's a late night drive coming home. Sometimes it's the, the situation that you have with a co-worker. Or it could be just seeing the way that your country and your countrymen are doing. But more, more importantly, it's, it's, it's probably things that you're going with. Your health and how you're feeling. Paul's thorn in the flesh. You don't tell me that's not being squeezed. That's being squeezed. Because I'm going to tell you something. Some of those grapes can have thorns on them. It's not easy getting them off. That's why they did use a sickle. So we have these great illustrations that are happening there. And we see now what you come across here is the poisonous grapes. And let's read verses 6 to 12 in Revelation chapter 13. You are there. If you're there, say amen. amen. God, God is wanting us to honor his word this morning. And with, if you don't find it in your Bible, that's okay. We've got it up on the screen. But I think it's very important that you still grab it and follow along with me. Whether you have it electronically or whether you have it in the, in the book itself. I, it wouldn't bother me if you came with your scrolls this morning and started unrolling it, okay? Word of God is the word of God, however you bring it. Amen? Amen. So... Verse 6, then I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on earth and to every nation and tribe and language and people. And he said with a loud voice, fear God and give him glory. All the time you run into angels all across the Bible, you hear them say, fear not. This is the first time this is said in the Bible. By an angel, fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and in earth, the sea and the springs of water. Another angel, a second followed saying, fallen, fallen is Babylon, the great. She has made all nations drink the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality, literally saying being drunk. Okay. A poison grape. And another angel, verse 9. A third followed them saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and its image and receives a mark on the forehead or on his hand, he also will drink the wine of God's wrath, poured full strength 
into the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of, who's it say at the end of verse 10 there? The of the Lamb. <clears throat> and smoke, and the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. And they have no rest day or night. These worshipers of the beast and its image and whoever receives the mark of its name. Here is a call for the endurance of the saints. Those who keep the commandment of God and keep their faith in Jesus. I won't have time to go through because we are showing the analogy of different kinds of grapes. But that verse 12 speaks to those who go through the tribulations. We've seen people fall away. And we wonder, were they saved? Not that they lose their salvation. But those who are truly born again, look at the end of verse 12, or really the, the middle of it, the endurance of the saints are those who come hell or high water, go through the trials the squeezing, the pressing out, believers will go through. And they don't. Oh, momentarily. We all doubt from time to time. Can I get a witness? Am I the only one that does that? But we don't walk away. I've tried to quit. I've tried. I quit. That's it. I'm done. I'm tired of this. And, and, you, and, and you, there's something inside you that brings the conviction no matter what you're going through. Listen to me. Every time you see that expression, the endurance of the saints, or his love endures forever, it is talking about eternity, and it is talking about... I, the, the one stage always saved is not in the Bible, but it is talking about the perpetuity of God in the calling of his loved ones. And I know that people have a problem with that. I know that they, they see, well, how can that person be saved? They see the lives of it. Doesn't matter if they're drawn back. There are times that we slip and trip from God's goodness, but we don't fall out and renounce the faith. I'll tell you one good way you can find this is listen to people in their talk. And when they take the Lord's name in vain in a continual way all the time, sure. they're not. They're not part of the fold. Sure. They can't do it. It's something that's about that name, isn't it? Mm -hmm. There is no name above that name. Amen. And so that is the endurance of the saint. No matter what you're going through, no matter what happens to your loved ones, no matter what personal things you experience, you say and you come out of it and say, I know there's a God. And not only that, I know he loves me. Amen. And I am his. And he is mine. And that is the endurance of the king. Right. The kingdom is to come in this passage here. Now, I, I can't emphasize that. This angel, not only is the first time it's said to fear God, it's also said, because all the time they say it's fear not because of the relationship. But here it's changed now because of what's about to happen on the earth. It is the kingdom of man is being exercised out for the kingdom of God. And this angel is preaching that gospel because they're going to be. And this, I have to come through. We won't have the time to go through it. But it comes out of Daniel. There are some nations that are going to rebel against the beast. And there are going to be some caught in the middle. They didn't get the mark. They didn't get the mark. This would be a terrible thing to be in the great tribulation, not get the mark, and still go to hell. Mm -hmm. But there will be some, as the 144,000 are being put into heaven, the angel this first angel preaches the gospel. It's the only time in the Bible the angel preaches the gospel. You know who the angels are supposed to be preaching the gospel? You and me. That is not just the pastor's job. That is all of us. So he is making this flyby, if you will, and he's telling the world that the creator of the world is going to judge them. Dios tare pero no Olivia. I don't know if I pronounced that right. He's going to check on it. But it means God delays, but he doesn't forget. And the patience, can you imagine that in the tribulation you've seen all these manifestations of God's judging the earth already for a better part of probably six years now. And you're seeing this 
and you're seeing the beast and you still die lost. You didn't take the mark. And so I believe that's what this angel is being called for to get these who are being pulled away from the poisonous grave. This is God's last call, okay? I know there's some of you in here, when I say last call, you know what I'm talking about, okay? This is his last call, all right? I've been there a few times, all right? So this small group's going to listen, and they're going to receive Christ, and they're going to give their life as a result. Fear God and worship him will be the gospel message. The beast message is the same. Fear me because I'm a God and worship me. Only he's the false God, right? Yeah. He is the anti-God. And God, God brings this out. It, it's an amazing time because you're seeing this amazing wrath just being poured out. Literally the cup of this wrath will come to point. But we used the scripture last week, and I give it to you. Habakkuk 3 says that the prophet, according to Shigunoth, and I had fun pronouncing that one, Susan. O Lord, I have heard the report of you and your work, O Lord. Do I fear in the midst of years, revive it. In the midst of years, make it known. In wrath. Woo. Remember mercy. Amen. What does that mean? That means that during this time, after this message is being preached, this will be it. No mercy. No grace. A world totally done wrong. This primo grapes are no longer in the influence. It is nothing but poison of people's pride and rebellion. And that really is the next verse that we see that comes in. It's the symbolism of Babylon. That's what happens here. If you look at verse number 9, it's powerful. And it, it, or in verse 8, it says, And another angel, second, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. Ba Babel means confusion. And the tower was being built in Genesis chapter 10 after the ark in Genesis chapter 6 when God flooded the world and man still rebellion. And they were led by a picture of the Antichrist, a fellow named Nimrod, a mighty hunter of men. And this rebellion and this spirit has continued on. For the Jews, it even means more, doesn't it? Because in 586 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar had their sacred temple just decimated. And Daniel knew this. And Babylon will be revised to some degree. I'm not sure if it's not just the symbolic pride and arrogance of man. The way that we're seeing, guys, we're seeing preachers lose the, come away from the faith. They never had it in the first place. We're seeing worship leaders come away from the faith. We're seeing that all around the world, all in the name of science and the future. And I know it's happened in the past, but we're seeing it in great, great ways. Jeremiah 25, in verse 15, it says that all nations are going to drink of the cup of God's full fury. Why don't you look at verse 9? Now, I'll catch this here. Another angel, a third. There's three angels here with a loud voice. If anyone worships the beast in the image and receives the mark, he will also, now notice verse 10, drink of the wine of God's wrath poured out in full fury, in full strength. There's no pulling punches like he does now because of us. I, I know what it means to have a punch pulled for me. My dad would play fight with us. And we would love to wrestle, and we would punch him as hard as we could in the stomach. He'd tighten up that old belly, and we'd hit him in the shoulder. And he would just, and we'd go rolling, tumbling, right? He'd just put a 200-pound, and that man had forearms like Popeye. And I mean, would knock us over and just go rolling. Listen to me. I watched that old man take a thick phone book and tear it with his hands. Other people have done that. I've never seen anybody take the hat that he tore and tore it with his hands. That put the fear of dad in me, I promise you. He was pulling his punches, even when he spanked us. But when mom said, wait till your dad gets home, y'all hear me? I mean a holy fear, which I believe contributed to my early salvation, even though my church, my family wasn't in church at that time. Dad's coming home. I know he can get a lot harder. I've seen what he's done to phone books. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? This is going to be God's wrath pulled out 
all the stops. All the stops. Here, I want you guys to think of it this way though. And this really leads into what I was talking about as far as the Lord's table. The disciples have fallen asleep. Jesus is alone in the garden. And he prays three times. Let this cup pass. God the Father did not pull punches on God the Son. And he took the full fury of his wrath on the cross. He, as it says there, he drank it. Amen. He drank it for us. Every Thing that we've done wrong that was brought into account has been poured into our Savior. And the pounding and the fury, it wasn't just our sin. And I've often preached that and still believe that it's connected as far as the wrath of the cup. It was Jesus became sin for us. We know that Corinthians says that. But it was the wrath of God upon him. Literally, the absence of mercy and the absence of judgment. No matter how hard my God, my dad beat me. There are some times I got some. Mom would always make us get a switch. And if we didn't get a switch big enough, uh, we had to go back out in the yard and get a bigger one. Okay. And she never used the derriere. She always used the back of the legs. And I'm going to tell you something. Those whelks were not fun. I, every time I walk by a bush and it scrapes up against my leg, I think of my dear sweet mom. But my, my dad, oh my goodness, I, I always knew that he had mercy and grace for me and didn't give me what I deserved because he pulled his punches. Mm -hmm. But not God's son. Not God's son. Remember what he finished that prayer with? Nevertheless, not my will, but thine. You ever take a spanking for a brother or sister that they did it and you got called for? How'd you feel? I tell you, it happened to me a lot. My brother got in trouble all the time. And somehow I would get right into it. It was a, it was, it was a friendly fire, but it was also a collateral damage. And there was just sometimes they believed him instead of me. Okay. I was never happy about it. I wanted to walk my brother, and sometimes I did. Listen to me. Our brother, the first fruits of our salvation, gladly took it for us. He gladly took it for us. The omnipotent God in full strength, with no mercy and no grace, poured it a powder, and he's going to do it again in the end times, at the end of this age. And that's where it comes into the third angel, bringing out the fire and brimstone of the preaching. I mean, he's not proclaiming it, it says around the earth like the first angel did, but he is bringing it out in fire and brimstone. And I want you to think of it as this way, no rest, day or night, it says, and forever and ever. The one word they're going to hear in hell is forever and ever and ever. The endurance of the saints gets us through the tribulation and we're saved and we receive that rest. Amen. They never rest. Right. I know what it's like to get tired. I know you do too. But I don't know what it's like to stay tired for all the, well, for days even. I get rest. Sometimes the body just shuts down. Can you imagine in hell it never shutting down? Charles Spurgeon put it this way. He said, if you do not believe God will cast his angels, actually, but he says God will cast unbelievers in eternal hell, you will not be sure that he will take believers into eternal heaven. And he's right. That is the balance of the creation order. And guys, just so that you'll see this, we thank God for verse 13. I want you to look at verse 13. Because getting through that is tough for anybody. But it says, and I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this, blessed are the dead. I've used this passage at, at, at funerals. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. 
from now on. We're at the end of the age, and it is now the harvest time for literally the peaceful grapes. It is a time of rest. It is a time that is totally opposite. And thank God that we have these verses, such as in verse 9, the endurance of the saints, and verse 13, where we see the peaceful grapes coming up. Because who, who go to work tomorrow and say to the people, blessed are the dead, they're going to look at you like, it's not... All Saints Day yet, but it's going to be one day All Saints forever. And you know what? They're not going to be some bony skeletons around. They're going to be in the full glory just as he is, so are we. How beautiful, how powerful is that? We don't receive the omnipotence of the full fury of God. We are saved into rest. Every time you see RIP, remember this. Revelation 14, verse 13. Revelation 14, verse 13. If it's in the Lord, they have rest. When you die, you are resting from your labor, your pain, your problems, and then you are rewarded. I, I think of it as in the terms of soldiers. You get your real R&R. &R, your real rest relaxation. Because you have laid down your sword, you have fought a good fight, and you have finished the course, and there is no more for you to do. You are at rest in him. And that is a beautiful passage, but then we go to the packed grapes. And, and, and guys, the packed grapes, this package is not good. They are going to be herded and put together, not like sheep, but like goats. Now, I've, I've had experience with sheep before. They don't hurt either. They're stubborn. But goats, you got a little bit of food, they're going to come and follow you. Like, I mean, they jump at it. They eat anything and everything in sight. And Jesus is using this imagery of what we see in verse 14 and 16. I looked and behold a white cloud and seated on the cloud, one like who? Jesus, with a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. This judgment's being done by the Son of Man, Jesus. And in verse 15, it says, And another angel, this is our fourth angel, by the way, we are angeled out here, and came out of the temple calling with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, put in your sickle. By the way, let me just throw you a little curveball here. That is not some little fluffy white cloud coming in. I believe that when Paul says he's coming back with a cloud of witnesses, I think that's what this is referring to. He is, we are part of this, and we are going to see this judgment. Put in your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is fully ripe. Remember, it's the kingdom of the man's harvest that is now up. God's harvesting of the saints has ended. No more salvation. It's over. When that first angel preached the eternal gospel, last call. There's coming a time. When I believe for the rapture, that's going to happen. But then there will be great tribulation. And in the tribulation, it will be the last call also. And if you're not saved before the wrath of God comes into play, you're going to have to experience terrible, terrible tribulation. And the Son of God is directing this. He's holding it. And, and notice this here. It's, it says at the end, his sickle is across the earth. And the earth, verse 16, was wheat. How can it get any more powerful than that? These kingdoms are squeezed out. That's the pressing that goes into what we see next. Just so you guys can see the pressing that goes into this kingdom of man. Human blood will rise to the horse's bridle and literally go for 184 miles. It will be known as the Battle of Armageddon, and we're getting the preview now. We're getting the teaser now, okay? Summer blockbusters come out, and you get the previews, right? I don't like watching the previews too much because half the previews are sometimes better than the movies. <laughs> this, though, nothing compares to what the real thing is going to happen. You're just seeing it as a preview of what's going to happen. The seeds that have been planted by the wicked ones are now coming to produce this horrible harvest. I mentioned at the beginning of this message, 
We are going to have the Lord's table, and it's going to be the Thanksgiving table, recognizing God's harvest. I don't think we really need the horn of plenty and all the uh, uh, gourds, the pumpkins, and all the different things to give you the picture of what I'm really talking about here. What I'm saying is, is that the harvest is to come is really what I'm praying for is the harvest of souls. But at this point, when it comes to the press grapes, it's the harvest of men and women's souls into eternity. The wine press of wine presses. It's the vat that they're all being collected. The sickles have come into the vine and they've made that cup. They put them on the wagons and they're dropping them to the wine vat. Now, Lucy and Ethel have the picture of all pictures, right? I was going to put it in there, but you, most of you know that show, okay? If it was, I, I would say maybe for Darren, that would be the one I would want to him to look that up. But they go around, they're, they're traveling in Italy, and they decide to crush some grapes. And the Italian women get mad at them because Lucy's not doing it right. Y'all remember that? And they're all screaming in Italian to them. And, all, and it's all this happening. They've taken that cluster and put it in. In Jewish circles, no. Hey, they didn't use their feet. That would be unclean. It was a millstone. And the millstone would be turned sometimes by a donkey. And then at other times, it was turned by the servants. And it would crush the grapes. And the, and, and the, and the wrath of God is pictured that way. So that's why I just wanted you to know I didn't use Lucy, okay? I just thought that would be there. I know the image is now in your head. The Bible says that the, the vines are going to be threefold. First and foremost, get this. I didn't put this on the screen. The Israeli vine. Jeremiah talks about it. Isaiah chapter 5 talks about it. The original vine source. But it's not the true vine. That vine is going to wither up and dry with the old, dry up as the Old Testament. The true vine is John chapter 15. When Jesus, the Son of Man, says, I am the true vine. And you must abide in me if you want to live. And if you abide in me, he doesn't just let you produce. Remember I talked about at the beginning, seedless grapes? I bought a ton of seedless grapes this week. Just H-E-B had a good sell. And I like seedless grapes, Okay. And I've eaten a ton of grapes. Trust me, my body knows. Here's the thing. Seedless grapes, you don't have to deal with anything. There's no spitting. But when produce comes, you abide in Christ. He is filling you up with seeds so that you can spread that seed all around the world. And the vine can continue to grow. With the help of the vine, it's matched in with those who are coming to Christ for the first time. The seed, obviously... When we talk about the weed and, the weed and the tares, the seed is the word of God. But this is also the... So the Israeli vine has dried up. Jesus is now the true vine. But now we are seeing the third vine in chapter 14. That is the first vine. And it is the one who's not just going to be dried up. It's going to be burned with sulfur and with great torment. That is the earth's vine. Look at verse number 18. I, I, I put this on the screen here. Another angel came out of it from the altar, the angel of authority over the fire. And he called with a loud voice to the one who had the sharp sickle, put in your sickle and gather the clusters from the vine of the what? The vine of the earth. For the grapes are ripe. Now I want you to notice that last verse there, that last word in verse 18. That word is different than the word in verse 15 that says that they are fully ripened. Fully ripened means they are connected in and they're bursting with flavor and full of seeds. This one means they're overripe and the time is too late and they're not going to have a good wine. That's very important for you to note. We don't see that in the English. It's there. All we have to do is recognize that the seeds that we have in verse 15, I can go back to verse 15 just so you guys can see this here. Look at the end of verse 15. But put in your sickle and reap for the hour to reap has come and for the harvest 
is fully ripe. And there's going to be that harvest that's going to come in. But here in verse 18, this ripe means it is over and they are past ripe. So it's a, it's, it's a for verse 15 is a perfect ripeness. Verse 18 is an overripe and their time is well spent. They're sour grapes. They are pressed grapes. And that is obviously the picture of human blood that is going to be poured out on the earth in the battle of Armageddon. The wrath of this vine will be nothing seen like it in all of history. Grapes. What are you connected to? What kind of grape are you? Are you a seedless grape, not bearing any fruit? Are you a sour grape, not saved? Or are you a grape that is a good grape that is truly at peace with God? 1976, one of my favorite hard rock bands, Blue Oyster Cult, came out with a song. And it was called... Don't fear the reaper. Just the opposite of what the angels are singing. In that context of the song, they were trying to redefine happiness that when I find love, either illicit or not, I can be suicidal with it being so crazed in it. And that we can change happiness if we need to go down that walk. I'm so crazed about you. Don't fear it. He literally was bringing out the drug culture and how that it's okay if you take a high and you die as long as you're with those that are loving. That's how bad that was. Christopher Walken made fun of it in Saturday Night Live when he came in as a producer and he came around and, oh, what's his name? Elf. Um, what's the actor's name? Will Ferrell. Will Ferrell was playing the cowbell. And Christopher Walken was said, what we need is more cowbell in that song. And it was hilarious. You'll see those bumper stickers from time to time. We need more cowbell. Let me tell you what we need. We need more gospel truth. Amen. That talks about that, yes, there is for those who are lost, they should fear the reaper. We should fear that judgment is coming. Even for us who are saved, that knows that we are blessed as being dead in Christ we still should respect it and show the respect to those who are dead. When you, when you hear people say respect for the dead, and I got this in my notes, and you see them take off their hat, the old towns around Texas will do that, won't they, when the funeral procession is coming by. You know what that really means? It's not meaning, we've taken it to mean respect for family, respect for what's happening as far as someone being buried. That's not what it was originally meant. What it meant was respect and honor for those who have died in the Lord. That's what it really means. There is no respect for those who are going to experience the place that was created for the devil and his angels. Sure. They're lost for all eternity. So Blue Oyster Cult had it wrong, even though they were leading a generation to a drug infused. Let me end with this in a song that you will remember. Civil War was starting up, and the Union troops were singing a song by a lady who, it was a good song because it talked about how the, the Union troops had to put down a rebellion of slave owners who were trying to fight the slaves, and many slaves were killed in that battle. But... This Methodist pastor told the lady, he said, that's not the best song. It's, it's so dark and it's not encouraging. She said, I know, he goes, I know you can write a better song. And she said, I'll pray about it. One for the troops who are going to free people. So she came up with this song. My eyes have seen the come, glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes are wrath are stored. He has loosed the faithful lightning of his terrible Swiss sword. I have seen him in the watchfires of a hundred circling camps. They have builded him an altar in the evening dews and damps. I have read his righteous sentence by the dim and flaring lamps. His truth is marching on. I have read a fiery gospel writ in burnished rows of steel. As you deal with my condemners, 
So with you my grace shall deal. How beautiful a line lyric is that. Let the hero, born of woman, crush the serpent with his heel. His truth is marching on. He has sounded forth the trumpet that shall never call retreat. He is sifting out the hearts of men before his judgment seat. Oh, be swift my soul to answer. Oh, be jubilant my feet. His truth is marching on. His truth is marching on. And then she ends it. As he gets quiet. And you know the hymn by now. The battle hymn of the republic. And it gets quiet. And it sings. In the beauty of the lilies. Christ was born across the sea. With a glory in his bosom. That transfigures you and me. As he died. To make men holy. Let us die. To make men free. If I was fighting that war. And I sang that song. I knew that I had a righteous cause. And I knew if I was saved, I would find rest in death because his truth is marching on. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we're thankful for this morning. We're thankful for the power of what we've seen. Lord, we just skimmed the surface on it. And it's within our nature not to want to even dig into this. And I've asked folks here to bring out the readings this week, and I pray that they will next week as we get into chapter 15. But Lord, whether we do or we don't, as saved or lost, your truth, Lord, is going to march on with or without us. And I pray, Father, that everyone within the sound of my voice will fear God, will humble themselves and confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of their life. And I pray that in his blessed Son's name. Amen.